Okay, so this is uh, lab four for oceanography. Um, it says it right up there. And so this lab goes over the ocean sediments. Um, and I know a lot of people had some questions about this, so I just wanted to quickly go through some of it. So there's a lot of background given here. Um, you should read through it. It corresponds pretty well to what's in your um, PowerPoint presentations. So it describes the different types of sediments you base the types of sediments on um, uh, what they form from. So there's terrigenous sediments, right, which are formed on land. This lab goes through it all very quickly. There are biogenous sediments, which come from organisms. There are hydrogenous sediments, right, so they might precipitate directly out of seawater. And then there are even cosmogenic sediments, right, things like micrometeorites that fall into the, uh, into the ocean. So there's lots of different types of sediments based on where they come from. And then another way to describe sediments is to look at their particle sizes. So this lab has a nice little figure here that shows the different particle size ranges. And so in geology, we have, this, we have these different terms for different sizes of grains. And so in geology, a boulder is not just a large rock. It's one that is more than 256 millimeters in its widest diameter. So some grains are perfectly spherical. Other ones are like oval shapes. So they have a longer and shorter axis, right? But that's, that's just part of how we describe them. Uh, but if the longest axis is over 256 millimeters, it's a boulder. If it's between 64 and 256 millimeters it's a cobble and then we have pebbles granules and all of these guys here these are all different types of sand so sand is a size class for a geologist not just it's not a material right um, like beach sand can be made up of a lot of different materials but it's all sand because it has these size ranges so sand is also it's pretty important it's well studied so it's divided up into this very coarse, coarse, medium, fine, and very fine sand. Below sand sizes, so 1 256th to 1 16th of a millimeter, you have grains that are silt sized. So you take a millimeter, you break it up into 256 parts, right? One of those parts is the width of a grain of silt. And anything smaller than that is a clay. Right, the grains are clay. So clay can be a kind of mineral, but it's also a size of a grain. So you can have a boulder made out of quartz, and it would, it would be a quartz boulder if it's 256 millimeters in size. You can have grains of sand that are made up of quartz, and they'll have those size ranges. You could even, in theory, have pieces of silt and clay that are also made out of quartz. Or you can have it made out of, fel of feldspar boulder, or feldspar sands, or feldspar clays. You can also have the different clay minerals, um, which are a special group of minerals that are also clay and silt sized. So the sizes are really important for us, right? There's there's lots of ways to think about these sediments. It's there's the minerals, the chemicals they're made up of. There's the way in which they were deposited or brought to a location, right? Was it from an organism? Was it from land? Um, was it from, from a meteorite? And then there are the size ranges of the grains. So those are all important parts of understanding an ocean sediment. So you might go to the beach and dig up a pile of sediment or sand or, or you know, um, um, uh, just sediments on the beach or in the water. And if you want to know about its size distribution, Right, you can run it through some sieves. So this picture here shows a stack of sieves. They're basically little screens, and you would take your big mixed sample of sand, right, and you would pour it into the sieve. And so you'd have big grains, and medium-sized grains, and small grains. The big grains will get stuck on here, and they can't pass through these little openings. But the smaller grains, they can go through. So they'll fall into this sieve. They'll get some of them will get stuck here, right? Okay, and then the really small ones 
who also pass through. And that goes on and on and on with smaller and smaller sieve sizes. Um, uh, and so you've, you've broken it up into all the different components of it. So you might start, again, you'll start off with a big random sample of, of sediments. And we'd like to know what are the ranges of sizes here so we can run it through a sieve stack. And these sieves, they can be, they can be small or they can be really big, like, like the size of a record, they can be eight inches across. Um, and we'd have stacks of sieves, <clears throat> um, one on top of the other. So they're open at the bottom and at the, at the top also. And the sediments go through here and they turn into these different size classes. So on this top piece, you might have pebbles. And then by the time you get down to here, you might have silts and clays, okay? So that's nice, you can break it up into the different components. We want, and then you could say, oh, there's very little cobbles or it's mostly um, clay sized or everything is sand sized here, or it's a mixture of sand and very little fine particles, right? But if you wanna put numbers on that, then you can calculate um, the percentages. So you might start off with a whole sample of sand of all different sizes, and you might find out that um, a quarter of it, that's a bad drawing, but a quarter of it might be uh, cobble sized. And then maybe, I don't know, just maybe 30% is sand sized, and, um, and so on. And so you might have a very small percent that is like 1% maybe, that is silt sized. Okay, so just, just conceptually, you can have this whole sample of, sand, of sediments, and then you can start telling us what percentage of the whole each, each sediment size um, uh, is. So conceptually, that's how you would do it. How would you do it in, in actuality, right? Well, you would weigh this sample, you'd get its weight. Right, and if and if it weighed a hundred grams, and then fifty grams was sand, that would mean that it's fifty percent sand. Right, so just as an overview, that's how you do that kind of thing, and that that's what we're doing in this lab. So in in a, an in-person lab, we would actually have these stacks. We'd weigh the sand, we'd run it through this, we'd get each so, and then we'd get each component. We'd weigh how much was stuck on here. We'd weigh how much didn't fall through this screen, then and we'd weigh each one of these, and some would be zero. Other ones would be a lot of weight, right? And that would allow us to calculate the percentage um, uh, of each size class. Now, once you know, this might be a little, this is a little hard to read, isn't it? Once you know the size distribution, right, then you can um, do some more with it. So here's a, uh, um, just like a theoretical, again, conceptual chart, right? It has the size of particles along here from very fine particles, to very coarse particles. So maybe boulders, gravel, sand, and then silts and clays. And in this particular sample, we might have found that there was a lot of sand sized particles and very little boulders and very little clays. And so now what you can do is this chart shows us the abundance of those different sand sizes, oh sorry, of those different um, grain sizes. So the higher the peak, the more of that particular size there was. So you can kind of think of it as a stack of these um, rectangles, right, instead of a nice curve, right? And so this might be 50% and this might be 40% and that could be another 10%, right? So each one of these could be that. So you can take that information you got before, where you weighed them and found out their percentages, and then you can just make a little, a little bar graph, right? Showing how much of each, uh, what percentage each size class was. And it would eventually look like this curve. So the curve is a really smooth, ver smoothed out version of that. So one sample of sand might look like this, one sample of sediments might look like this, another sample might look like that, right? And another one might look like, like um, oh, this is a little split up, it might look like this. So this could be a beach in, you know, Brooklyn. This could be a beach out on Long Island. This could be a beach from New Jersey. 
right? They might all have different distributions of their grains. This could also be, so this lab talks about it, this could also be different zones along the beach. This could be the dry part of the beach, right? This could be the part that is in the area that is hit by waves, um, uh, the way the waves go back and forth, and this could be um, a sample taken from uh, a part of the beach that is always underwater, right? So going increasingly offshore, right? So you might see different patterns based on where you are along the beach. Uh, and I'll just move down to this one too. So we had, I just described a really simple situation where you have like one peak. Most of the grains are centered around this size range. Here's another sample where they're also have, they have one peak. They're mostly centered around one size range, even though it's a different size. But here's a sample. So another beach, right? Um, or another location along the beach where the particle sizes have two peaks, right? And so we call this a bimodal distribution. There's two modes, modes like kind of an average, right? So this is unimodal, okay? One mode, and this is bimodal. Two modes, right? And you could even in theory have trimodal and all kinds of other ways to describe that distribution. So we might, when we're doing scientific work, or when we're studying this stuff, we might say, um, oh, here's the full, here's a chart of every um, uh, grain size that was found in that sample, and there's a whole bunch of numbers to look at. We might say, instead of providing a table of the values, we might just draw the histogram, right? Or we might even just say we, that this sand had a unimodal distribution, this other sand had a bimodal distribution, centered around the, you know, the coarse sands or centered around the fines and, and the cobbles or something like that. So we can describe it in a lot of different ways, some with more and more finer details, right? So just being able to describe it in words ends up being useful. So in this lab, since it's online, you obviously aren't collecting sand and running them through sieves and all that stuff, right? Um, so we'll skip past this for a minute. So there's this, this chart that's X'd out. You don't need to use this because this is for when you have the sand samples and you're running through them. You instead have this chart, okay? And so on the PDF, this chart is filled. Uh, these zeros are empty and you have to put down the value. So you have to calculate what they what these values are. So let's just look at this. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So what you have here is um, a chart showing this is kind of typical of what we would work with. It tells you the, the actual like um, linear size, right? The, the, the millimeter or meter or, you know, micron measurements that you're using. The size terms that those correspond to. So coarse sand isn't just any kind of, you know, larger grains. It's, just, it's these particular ranges of sizes. And so this is all descriptive. And then here, um, we have the weight that was measured in this experiment, right? So it's as if someone else did this experiment and weighed out the sands and separated them and everything. So you have none of this sample is very coarse sand. Only half of a gram is uh, this range of coarse sands. Here you have just a little bit more than one gram that is medium sand in the 0.35 to 0.42 range, okay? You can, um, so, so you have all these measurements here. And then if you look at the bottom, there's all these weights. They are then added up. Right? And so actually really what you would normally do is you'd weigh the, the sample before you even started separating it. And so this is the total weight of the sand sample, the original weight. And so each one of these other things, they are just portions of that total. And what you want to do is calculate what percentage of this whole sample <clears throat> is silt. What percentage of this whole sample is coarse sand in that range, right? 
So like quickly, what, sample, what percentage of the sample is very coarse sand? Well, 0%. So you can leave that there. So 0 divided by the total um, as a percent, right? <clears throat> so let's, let's take a look at that calculation. So here you have very fine sand in this size range. 2.88 grams of the total sample are, are, are this. What percentage is that? So you can take your calculator. You have 2.88, what happened? Why is it not working? Okay, you have 2.88 grams of sand in that size range divided by the total, right, which is 115 down from the bottom. That equals this number. Multiply that number by 100, and you get 2.5. So in that case, we have 2. Point, oh, where am I going to write this? We have two. I'll just write it here, just so we know the number. 2.50 percent. So two percent of this entire sand sample is very fine sand between 0 0.07 millimeters and 0 0.09 millimeters. So you're going to do that. That count. So you took the um, you took the sand weight, or the what I should really say is the fraction weight. You divided it by the total weight of the whole sample, and then you multiplied it by a hundred because you get a small number. You have to multiply it by hundred to get percentages, right? That's going to equal a percentage. So you're going to repeat that for every one of these, okay? And you're going to fill it out on the PDF. And just looking at it, point, point 0.1 grams out of, out of a, over 100, 0.69 grams out of over 100, these are going to be very small percentages. 21 out of the 115 grams are, are this kind of uh, sand. That's going to be a large percentage, right? 36%, uh, sorry, 36 uh, grams are this kind of fine sand. Well, that's going to be a large percentage uh, for that one. Now, looking at the chart again, you'll notice that it's it's got two parts. So over here, there is it's maybe not obvious to everyone. <clears throat> There's sample one, and then we do all this stuff for sample one. So someone went out to a place, they dug up the sand, they ran it through the sieves, and these are the weights they got. Then maybe someone else at the same place or the same person at a different place took another sample, another shovel of that sand. And they ran it through the sieves, the same sieve stacks, and they got these weights. You're going to calculate the percentages uh, uh, here also. And so now notice, for sample one, the total weight was 115. That's how much they shoveled into the sieves. And for sample two, they don't have the same weight. It's a different amount that was put into it. So this is actually kind of a nice example because how can I compare the sands from these two places, right? I can't just look at the weights of any particular uh, size fraction, right? Because maybe at this location, maybe I collect like a thousand grams of sand. And then at this location, maybe I only collected a couple of grams. So the absolute weights aren't really useful. I need to have it turned into these percentages. And then if this sand has a different percentages of, of these sizes than that one, that might be useful. If I was told that I had a whole bunch of sand samples and two of them were from the same exact location, I would expect them to have the exact same spread of percentages, right? And other places might have a different spread of those percentages. Right, a different profile. So this can, you know, very vaguely be used in like forensics uh, to tell us if a sample corresponds to one location or another or something like that. So it, it's useful in a lot of different ways. It's useful for classifying and describing these sands to geologists, and it's useful for, you know, other kinds of work. <clears throat> okay, so again, it's a lot, but you're just taking the, w the weight of that fraction and you're dividing it by the total weight of the whole sample. And so this doesn't, this is 100%, so it doesn't matter, because it's everything, right? Okay. Then it asks you some questions like, um, 
Oh, yeah, okay. So once you've got them, you then go to the next part. So on the next page, let's zoom in a little more. You don't need to use this. <coughs> this is X'd out <coughs> because it's uh, it, it corresponds to when you do the experiment in person. And then over here, we have the chart for you to use for the online version, right, where the data was given to you. So in this one, I'll zoom in again. You have two, well, first off, I'll go back. You have two different tables. Table one is for the first sample, and table two is for the second sample. Okay? And if we move in a little. If you look at them, they look very familiar at this point. You have the range of sizes, okay? The terms and the ranges, these correspond to the same thing on the other, other um, table. And then you have this, this, you know, this table to fill out. How do you fill it out? Well, if you look at the bottom, over here are the it's it has an x-axis in percentage, and it's very blocky. It goes from zero to ten, ten to twenty, till so each square is ten percent. Okay. So let's say this is wrong, but let's just pretend that in sample one, the silt, right? Let's pretend the silt was 30% of the sample, right, from that from that other uh, page that you just did. You can then show that here by filling in this block and that block and then that block. And so some anyone looking at this will say, oh, this sample, right, was 30% silt. And then it might only be you know, 1% of this other guy. And maybe there was, you know, 5% of this guy. And then maybe there was, you know, a large percentage of this piece and another large percent of, of uh, in this size class. You can estimate, you know, between here and here is 45. So there's also five little marks there. You can get it pretty close. In the PDF, what you can do is you can just type little dots or X's, right, or anything you have to do in order to just fill it out. And this can be pretty approximate, <clears throat> okay? I just want to see people have, been, have put something in, um, you know, if you have 45% instead of 50, that's not wrong. If you have 30 instead of 50, that's obviously pretty wrong, right? Uh, so you would fill this out. And what you're going to end up with is a bunch of, um, this, this doesn't work because it all adds to way over 100%, um, but you might get something like, this kind of distribution. And that distribution, what you've been doing is you're actually making a histogram. So once you filled all of them in. So a histogram is like a bar chart and, and then the, the bars go out to the percentages of each thing. And you could even start connecting the tops of the bars. And that should look like, or it could look like, the previous pictures that we saw. Right? It could look like those other distributions that we saw. So they could look something like this. So if you took this on its side, it would it might resemble um, this chart pretty well. Okay. And then what you want to do is at some point it asks you to describe these. So you've described you've already described them, right? You made that table that has the numbers. So anyone that, w anyone that wanted to read your report could look at those numbers and know exactly what they were. Someone could also quickly glance at this um, histogram that you've created. You don't need to, tr to trace the shape, right? You just fill out for each and every one how, how much they are. Um, or you could just describe it. So here, this might be described as a unimodal distribution centered around the coarse sands. I just made this up, though. And so then you can compare these two samples very rapidly, right? Looking at the picture, they might have very different uh, charts to them, right? So you can describe these samples and differentiate them or make other statements about them um, using this basic information. So that's why we have you do it. So this is something the people that work with sediments do all the time. Um, it's like a first description of the sediment samples that we might be getting. Now, we might be really interested in the fossils that are present in there, or the chemicals that are present, or it might be sand that's not just taken from a beach, it might be sand that's taken from the deep ocean, and it's from, <coughs> you know, a million years ago. 
Uh, um, so there's other things we might want to get, but this is the first thing we do, right? What does, we do kind of call this the lithology or sedimentology of the samples. Um, yeah, so it asks you a few questions to fill out, like describe the, um, the, fill out these charts and describe the distributions and all that kind of stuff. Then it kind of switches modes in, into this um, part of the question, part of the lab. So here, this is kind of a famous example in um, uh, oceanography and marine, oceanography and marine science. So this little map that's shown here, this is uh, a map of, of, Nova, of Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. It's part of Canada. So we have this land here. This is like northern Canada east and eastern Canada, right? So the U.S. and where we are is way, way down here. And this is the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean. And it's maybe hard to see here, but it's showing some topography here. These dotted lines are the topography. And so maybe you normally see topography as like, like, um, you know, concentric circles, right? And you might say to yourself, okay, this is, this is a hill. I would, if I was, if I'm looking down at a map, right? Like bird's eye view, looking down at the land, this might be what a hill looks like. And so the hill would in, in profile, maybe look like that then we would show it in this way, just like super brief, you know, how do those kinds of maps work. So that works on dry land, it also works in the ocean. And so I'll just, what you're seeing here is, is, is a channel. <clears throat> uh, this is a deep, a steep, deep valley or channel in the ocean, right, in the ocean floor. So you have some flat land up here, and then you drop down into this channel. So it's kind of the opposite of what we had here. Right, so what, what, you're, what you're looking at in that picture is you have the flat land and then you go into a deep channel. Okay, that, this is a profile. Right, and all this is under the ocean. And so um, that's what the land looks like. And so into these deep channels, you sometimes have what well, on dry land would be an avalanche or a mud landslide. In the ocean, we call it a turbidite flow because it's a little bit different. It has a special name, but it's basically a kind of avalanche under under the water um, along those steep cliffs. And so what happens is that in these channels, you have these turbidite flows, these collapses that run through the whole channel. Then they kind of clear it out, right, and scour it out. And then you get a deposit of sediment somewhere at the bottom. Now, that happens normally in, in nature, and we weren't really aware of it, um, or how, or we didn't know a lot about these kind of turbidite flows and these these submarine avalanches um, until this event happens. Um, so this is in I think um, yeah 19, the 1930s 1929, and so the technology then was different from today, and they had these telegraph lines, and so they're only showing part of it, but these telegraph lines would go from you know Canada and the U.S. to like Europe. And this would allow communications between Europe and the U.S. and North America, right? Um, using telegraphs, right? Like those, like Morse code, dot dot dot, dash dash dash, kind of, kind of thing, right? Um, and so these were all, these were lines that were laid down by ships on the seafloor. And so here you have this canyon, and the lines are going across the canyon. And they're dipping into it in some places and, and everything else, right? So let's just go back to that profile pic. Here's the canyon. There's a here's a little cartoon boat. Okay, I'm not very bad drawing. And and they were laying down these these lines, these telegraph lines. And so you get them like this. And maybe sometimes they droop into the canyon or whatever. Okay. So this was this was the setup. You had all these lines and cables going across. We, so I'm saying this is telegraph lines. We have these today, right? We still have them today for um, internet communication and other kinds of um, telecommunication uh, lines. They're actually still out there. They, we've laid many new ones since then. But so these were really important. This is how people in the US and, and Europe and other parts of the world, how we could have like global communications uh, back in 1929. So in 1929, there was an earthquake. The earthquake was centered here. That shaking caused a collapse of the marine sediments, and it caused this turbidite flow or avalanche. And 
the avalanche ran down the canyon and it started snapping these lines. It started, it started breaking them apart as that you know, flow of mud and sediment and boulders or whatever was in there crashed into them. It ripped them apart. And so the communications that were going on between these across the ocean, they got shut down. And we knew, so that was bad. <laughs> and people realized, oh, there's all this stuff going on down here, right? There's, there's all this movement of, of material, uh, these submarine avalanches that are happening. Uh, we know about it because they interrupted our communications. We had to go out and relay these lines. And it took time to even figure out what actually happened, right? So they were able to detect the earthquake. And they, then they were able to realize that, you know, their communications got cut off. It took time to figure out what the connection there was, what actually happened, right? Because there's lots of things going on in the world at any moment. So this, and now as these, so when the, the real story is that as these, um, as, after the earthquake happened, the turbidite flow, the avalanche flowed down the canyon. And so it hits this cable first, right? And then this one second, and then this one third and fourth and everything, right? So it hits them in sequence. We know exactly when they were hit because we know the time that we lose communication. And we know where these cables are because we laid them down. So we know exactly how far apart the cables are. So if you look here, this is just showing you the cables that were broken, how far each cable was from the source of the earthquake, from its epicenter, how deep in the ocean it was. This is These are deep water, that's five kilometers, 5.4 kilometers, right? 4,000 meters deep in the ocean. And how long after the earthquake started that the cables were snapped. So we have seismograph stations that tell us when the earthquake started. That's like time zero. Eight hours after the earthquake starts, this first cable gets snapped. It's 277 meters from the site of the earthquake. So it this flow was able to travel 277 meters in eight hours. Uh, sorry, um, uh, kilometers in eight hours. So 270, so we can tell, we can get a speed from that. Kilometers and hours, right? There's a distance and, and a time. If we have distance and time, we know how fast someone was going. So I'll just quickly put this back up. All right, and so if you had, if you were going 277 meters, kilometers, in 8.13 hours, that means you were traveling 34 um, kilometers an hour. And so we can look at how this um, this flow crossed the canyon, and so you're asked to find the average speed at which it, it flowed down the canyon. And so the way to get the average, the best way to get the average is to take the total distance and divide it by the total amount of time. So this is kind of like if you're in a car and you go from your house to location one, and, and then you go to another place, and you're going to a whole bunch of different places. When you're driving between place, you know, location, the grocery store and the, you know, um, CVS, right? You might be going one speed. And then if you go to your friend's house, maybe you can get on the highway. So you go a different speed. So you would have different speeds during all of this, right? But if we wanted to know your average speed during this time, we would find the total time, total distance, and divide it by the total time. So maybe you drove with many stops, a hundred miles, and you did the whole thing in one hour. Your average speed was a hundred miles an hour, right? Maybe one part was faster, other parts were slower, right? So you can calculate the total distance and the total time, and you can get the average speed. So you would take this distance, subtract this distance from it, and that'll give you a change in distance. And then you would take this time and subtract that time from it. That would give you the change in time. So, you know, you don't you don't necessarily add up all of these times or something like that. If, if that's if that's not clear, you want to find the change 
from point one to point seven and the time between point one and point seven. Uh, and so once you've done that, then you've calculated the, um, the average speed of it, okay? So that's, that's what we're looking for in that one also. Um, oh, I, I kind of worked through some, right? So, uh, so for example, these are the kinds of answers you're, you're kind of looking for, right? So here we go from 450, the, the cable break at 450 kilometers, the cable break at 277, the difference is 173, the difference in time between those two things was 0 0.89. The speed is change in distance divided by change in time. So this was the change in distance. This was the change in time. You get a speed of 194 kilometers an hour. So this one was very, very fast, right? And so that was going from the 277 to the 450, okay? So it's going almost, almost 200 kilometers an hour when it when it travels from from this line to that line it's going very fast um, and so this is you can use this for calculating the the total average okay you're going to see that it's slower overall the first part is much faster the later stages kind of make sense right you're running downhill you're running down a canyon you lose speed over time and so we're trying to calculate the average speed of the whole collapse um, yeah, so you can do that. Oh, and then there's this other part, right? Um, now this part shows you how to, is asking you to make a graph. So look at the, um, let's look at the whole thing first. So it's really just a piece of graph paper. And on the bottom, it has distance from the epicenter in kilometers. Right, that's what the KM is. And then so that's the x-axis. And then the y-axis is hours between earthquake and breaks. So break one, what was its data? It happened um, at 277 kilometers distance. Okay, that's its X value. And its Y value um, was 8.13 hours. So when you make a, a, a graph, you take the x value, find out where it is, and you kind of draw a line all the way up. And then you look for the y, corresponding y value, find out where it is. You kind of you can draw this imaginary line across. And where they intersect is where you put your point. And so that was done here for point one, for the first break, right? So it's about 270, here, here's the x for it, it's about 277 for the x value and it's here's 8 and so it's a tiny bit and here's 9 right so across one cube is a, a value of 1 so 8.13 is really close these are just estimates and they kind of correspond to this point here which is marked with an x the next spot would be break 2 okay so break 2 broke at 450 kilometers distance. That's the X value. And it took 9.02 hours for that to happen. That's the Y value. So 450, here's 400. Here's, it's maybe hard to see, but you can see it on your, your copy. And here's 500. So this must be 450. So we're going to go up this line somewhere. And over here we have 8. 9, 10, right? We're at 9.02 is what we want, so I'll just follow this line across. Okay? And so break number two happens at this intersection. And then you can do that for all seven breaks. So you're going to have seven points here, right? And what they're going to do is, you know, visually, what they're doing, what they're showing you is distance and time. And I, I don't know what the chart's going to look like, but pretend it's something like this. If you know that this is, dis not Tim, but time. If you know this is distance and time, you can tell that whatever was going on here, whether it was a car or whatever this object was, it sped up and then slowed down, right? Um, and so like we might expect the chart to look something like this in a lot of instances, right? Where something has a high speed and it goes down to a slower speed. Or maybe it eventually 
what we expect for most things actually is that they'll have whatever their speed is and they might go down to zero right which means that they'll uh, they've come to a stop so you can look why do we do this right why do we bother going through this table and, and charting it like this it will tell us about the changes in speed of that submarine avalanche and so people didn't know about these things really at first and it really started to convince people that they were powerful there was a lot of energy involved that they could move very quickly and that they could change the the seafloor even this these sediments don't just snap cables they can scour out the bottom of those canyons and valleys and make them deeper um, so these are all different and like I said this this is kind of a famous example um, these uh, these breaks along the Grand Banks Canyon um, off of Nova Scotia it's when people first started to realize that this was happening so only 1929 right less you know about a hundred years ago um, which isn't that long ago um, and so they were, we were able to understand what's happening with these sediments on the seafloor the seafloor is not some inactive you know flat place where there's just you know mud on the bottom and that's it right there's different kinds of sands there's there's coarse materials there's finer materials um, Different locations have different distributions of those um, uh, different sediment sizes. So some places have a lot of fine sand. Some places have a lot of coarse stuff. Sometimes we find anomalously large boulders and cobbles there. We have to try to explain them. They're, we think they're linked to like the uh, growth and retraction of, of ice sheets. Um, we calculate that data in terms of these tables to share it with each other and, and try to understand what's happening. And then, you know, in the introduction, it talks more about the... Uh, the setting in which you apply these things, right? So we have different beach profiles. You can tell very quickly from here now that, you know, this place has a lot of clay and very little of anything else, right? Um, so it tells us about all these different, and it corresponds to these different places along the, along the beach, right? From where we are to where it gets very deep and there's lots of boats out there. Uh, so this is how we're able to understand what's happening with these different marine sediments. Okay, so um, you guys give that a try. I've extended the date for the upload. This all works because we have these nice little stacks of sieves. Um, try to answer that and give it to, and hand it in. Oh yeah, and these pictures here, what's going on here, these are some examples of the sediments. So they're not just, you know, spheres of certain sizes, right? These are like the shells and remains of different plankton and different marine organisms. So sometimes they make up the sediment in, entirely, right? Um, so it's just, again, one way in which we try to understand these sediments, which tell us about processes in the ocean. So give that a try, upload that, um, and, and then we'll see how, it, how that goes. Okay.